Hey, Adam Richardson here, pastor at Sandhurst. Thank you for joining us for this stream on your device. And we have prayed it would be an encouragement and a blessing to you on your journey. If you're outside the Sandhurst family, we hope that it will only supplement and not replace the teaching that you receive from your leaders and the care you receive in the church where you are plugged in. If you have any questions about renewing or starting a relationship with God through Christ, please contact us through the email or the phone below and we'll be in touch. A few tech suggestions for the best online experience. First of all, the bigger the device, the better. So ideally you can plug your phone into your television. If you're having any tech trouble, you can reach out to Reeves Cannon at this number below. So we'd love for you also to repost and share this link so others can enjoy it as well. So we have prayed that this will be a blessing and encouragement to you, enjoy. Good morning, my name is Julie. The scripture reading today is 1 John 5, 13 through 21. It's found in the church Bibles on page 864. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray to God, and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that, All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Julie. And uh, to Caleb and the band. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Today is week 10, and we'll finish 1 John. Just to recap, the apostle John is writing towards the end of his life. It's about 50 years after he wrote the gospel, so a couple things have happened. The church has grown magnificently, and two groups have poured in, a group of Jews and a group of pagans, a mixture of Romans and Greeks. Now, there were a lot of confusing ideas as those waters came. You have rapids that form, and the rapids were this. The Jews had the idea, and we can just see this from our Old Testament in broad strokes, that if you went through the motions, that was the main thing. didn't matter if your heart was really there or not. If you could just tick the boxes and, and get, her done, get her done, that was what they considered their religion. That's called legalism. The Greeks had the idea, the opposite idea. Hey, if you just believed in your heart, you know, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. You know, only the spiritual matters, not the physical matters. And so just as long as you care about it and you you love it, then you're free to just do what you like with your physical body. That is called, well, now we call it Neoplatonism. So we had the legalists and the Neoplatonists, one focused on actions, one focused on the heart. We have another Greek word that describes the separation of your affections and your deeds. We call it hypocrisy, okay? And so John is going to bridge this ancient disconnect that we feel today by answering two age-old questions as John wraps up his book and we wrap up with him. He'll kind of come full circle and answer these two age-old questions. And the first one is this. It's maybe the question of life. Can you know God? And it, while it seems very simple to us here in Florence, well, of course you can. Yeah. It's not so simple to people around the world and perhaps from history. Another way we ask the question is, uh, can you be sure you're a child of God? The way we normally say it is, can you be sure you're going to heaven? They're all the same question, and that's something he's going to address today. Because... 
There are three types of agnosticism, and I only mention them because they actually matter, and believe it or not, they impact you and me, and this is what they are. They're, the three types of agnostics are hard, soft, and agnostic. No, not a typo. A hard agnostic says, I don't know, you don't know, nobody can know. Soft agnostic says, I don't know, but I'm seeking to know. An agnostic agnostic says, I don't know, and I don't know if you can know. And that third type is basically what America is. America is the exception, by the way. Most countries believe in something. If you travel the world, you will see that the, the idea that I don't know, and I don't know if you can know, is really a little American, but it's a little Western bubble. Most countries believe in something, and they believe what they believe is true. So, but that we don't live there, we live here. So what, the reason that agnostic agnostics impact us is that what it does is it causes us to doubt our, the fact that we can believe something. The general, the ethos, the, the air we breathe, you know, the two fish are in the tank and the old fish swims by and says, hey guys, how's the water today? And the, the one young fish looks at the other young fish and goes, what's water? <laughs> the water we swim in is, is, is doubt, Complete disintegration. Marx said in his, um, oh gosh, what was his great work? The Communist Manifesto. He said, um, I want to turn everything that's solid to liquid. And that's what our society has done. Turn everything from solid to liquid. Turn everything that's true to agnosticism, to, to, to doubt. And so it impacts you and me and we, it begins to erode our own faith that we can believe in something or even should believe in something. But can I just promise you guys I've lived most of my adult life outside of this country and actually in other centuries. I got a PhD in the 17th century and I'm just telling you that the world around us and history beneath us believes in stuff. Not only is it okay, it is necessary. And as we come to this text and as we come to the end of uh, 1 John, we're gonna need to believe in something. John is not ashamed to believe. He has both conviction and compassion. And he's going to answer this question today, can you know that you know God? Can you know that you're going to heaven, which is to be in the presence of God forever? The second question John's going to answer is here, and that is, is it faith or works? Is Is the Christian life more about believing the truth? Pray this prayer. Believe this thought. Have conviction. Or is it about works? Is it about living the life? Is it love and obedience? After all, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, by grace you've been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It is the free gift of God. But then James in 2, 26 says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So which is it? Faith, not works, or faith and works? So John is gonna actually answer these today. Chapter five, we started it last week, verses one through 12, defining the faith, who we are. Defining the faith, what it means to be a Christian. That's the second question, faith and works. Verses 13 to 21, which will be our focus today, defined by the faith, how we live. And so, because John has kind of ended the book on verses 12 and 13, right there in the middle, that's his concluding point. And then really verses 13 to 21 is his postscript that says, okay, since all that is true, there's a couple things I wanna unload as a father to the church here. I wanna unload these couple of things before you go off to college. Here's my last, my last parting words of advice and counsel as you launch into your Christian faith, as these rivers come together of legalism and Platonism as you know, what matters is the spirit, what matters is the body, what matters is faith, what matters is works, and can we know God at all? Here's my parting encouragements and challenges to you. And so that's what John's gonna do today. So pray with me as we begin. And we neglected to mention in the um, um, the moment when we're praying for our missionaries that we actually have missionaries not this week but in a future week we're gonna be deploying missionaries to a fourth continent to this continent in fact to Florence right remember Power Up Clubs is coming up in July and let's pray that God would we have 12 host homes we're looking for 36 praying for 36 mission points around Florence that week 
uh, like we've done in years past. And so let's pray that God will give us wisdom in this moment and also for our fourth mission point for Power Up Clubs. Join me in prayer. Father in heaven, as we gather here in your name and your presence to study your word by the power of your spirit, I pray that you would give us eyes to see not just the truth, but the beauty and the sweetness of the truth. I pray that we would understand and long to know you, to follow you, to love like you, to live like you. Lord, there's some tough uh, points in this text. I pray that you would help us navigate them, understand them, and apply them for your glory, for your great namesake, for your renown. Through Christ our Savior, we pray. And Lord, I, before we, I pray for our power clubs, I pray for 36 host homes that we would continue on mission as your grace calls us in. It would send us out. John didn't want us just to get fat on his words. He wanted us to burn those calories. So help us, Lord, to believe and to love, not only in word, but in deed and in truth for the sake of your name. In Florence, in Ecuador, in Spain, in India, Nepal, and in every uttermost corner of the earth. May you fill the earth with your light. In Jesus' name, amen. A quick review of verses 1 through 12 for those who may uh, not have been here last week. Verse 1, we believe in Christ. We have faith. So he's talking about faith. We have faith, love, and obedience. So remember, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So we have faith. But we also love. We love God and people because our faith is then it must fructify in love. You don't just get born into the family. You grow up in the family likeness. If babies are born and they don't grow, that's a problem. Not a little problem, a big problem. But we Christians think it's okay. It's not okay. We have to be born into the family and grow in the family likeness. So everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is born into the kingdom of God, is born as a son or a daughter of God, and everyone who loves the father and loves his child as well. So we believe and we love. So those are the two opening parts. What about obedience? Where does that fit? Faith, love, and obedience. Remember, we, we abide in flow. We are obedience. We honor God through our love. So is obedience different from our love? No. When they ask Jesus, Jesus, there's these 613 commands in the Old Testament. Which one is the most important? Where do you think he would have gone? Where would the obvious place to be? Ten commandments. Come on, people, work with me. I mean, come on, ten commandments. You can't make the fruit hang any lower than that. All right? When they said, what's the most important commandment, you would expect him to go to the top ten, right? And did he do that? No, he didn't. He said, I will summarize the entire law, the, your obedience to God in two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Whoever does these things has completely fulfilled the law. So Jesus is equating loving God and people to fulfilling obedience. So that's why I call obedience honoring love, honoring the model God's given us. So in the 10, when God gave Moses the 10 commandments on Sinai, I remember the first words he said were not, you shall have no other gods before me. Rewind a couple of sentences and God says, I am the Lord your God. I made you. I created you. I designed you in my image who brought you out of Egypt. Not only did I make you in my image, I redeemed you. I brought you back from the dead. You were dead and now you're alive. Based on my redemption of your life, live in such a way to honor your image, my image in you. Live in a way. And if you do these 10 things, that will honor my image in you. Honoring love is what obedience is. That's how Jesus defined it in the New Testament. It's how God defined it. It's Sinai. So we have faith, love, and obedience in the first three verses of chapter five. Flow. We've got to remain in flow, okay? Faith. This is love for God. We see it again. To obey his commands. See, I'm not making this up. I just read ahead, right? This is love for God. To obey his commands. So he is equating obedience. and It's not really uh, different. Remember the love, the dictionary definition of love? An intense feeling of deep affection. This puts love centered on who? Me. 
The world's definition centered on me. The second definition, dictionary. This is out of Webster. A great pleasure or interest in something. Again, what matters in this definition is my response to whatever's happening. And whatever's happening must produce this good thing in me. That's love. Now, the world has a definition. That's the dictionary definition. There is a cultural definition. Endorsement of all my feelings and actions. That sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, but that is exactly what people expect. When I was a senior in high school, it didn't just start last week, people. When I was a senior in high school, I had a Unitarian Universalist friend. We watched my English teacher who was married with children go through a terrible divorce because her husband, who was a minister in a mainline denomination, I will not mention because I respect that denomination and several of brothers in this city of that denomination, he left her because he fell in love with another woman. And my Unitarian friend supported that. Well, he found love. We need to support him. In spite of the fact that it tore a family in half and endorsed his childishness and selfishness. Basically, when love got hard and doing your vows got hard, wife swap. No, no. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, God asks us to be big boys and girls, men and women. We don't do that. God calls us to honor our commitments because he honors his commitments and we're made in his image. That's why we do it. But I guess if you don't have Anchor, an anchor in him. Good luck. So, this is, uh, dictionary, society, but God has a more robust definition of love. The steadfast, sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another. Now that's a definition that has compassion and backbone. That's some love that can take a punch. Steadfast sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another. What if we could fill the earth with that kind of love? <laughs> they'd, have to write, they'd have to rewrite the dictionary. I look forward to that day. Okay, I got lost in my nowhere. Where was I? Oh, yeah. God's love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it does not delight in evil, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We saw it in 1 John 4, just the last chapter. By the way, we don't love God. We only love him back. He's always, always loving us first. 1 John 4, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son, steadfast, sacrificial love for the true good of another. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him because of his death, that we might live. This is love, verse 10. Not that we love God. There we are. We don't love him. We love him back. This is, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, so also we ought to love one another. So he's saying, since God set this example of sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another, since he loved that way, let's love that way. So that's the argument John is making in the opening verses. And that, that love is a blessing. He says, it is uh, this love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Okay, somebody, but, but before I got out of here last week, I had an email from one of you saying, wait, his love is burdensome. That's hard. And, um, and no, I mean, it was, it was a good email. <laughs> we had a great uh, discussion on it. But I get it. Um, hello, it is burdensome. Yes and no. No, it is not a weight that we have to carry. All right, it is not a weight we have to carry. But yes, it is difficult I remember one time my kid, one of my kids who was learning to drive asked me, Dad, is driving hard? Well, if you mean like just turning the wheel and pushing the pedals, no, it's quite easy. But if you mean avoiding all the other guys who are coming at you, yeah, it's pretty hard. To be aware when it's raining, when it's dark, when it's foggy, when it's rush hour. Yeah, that's hard. But there's a blessing that comes through it if you learn to do it, Right? And not just with driving, our son John, who is a junior in high school, is learning to fly. 
And so here he is doing his solo flight a week or two ago, and he's talking to his classroom instructor and his flight instructor, and they're giving him his kind of final pep talk. And I, uh, you know, before he goes up and explaining how this is going to go and giving him his instructions. Now, let me just ask you, are they burdening him? Are they just laying it on him, a weight? You know, he's got to carry all that information. As a, oh, you're just so, you know, you're killing my fun here. So here they are walking away. This is the moment where I almost pass out. (laughs) And John gets in the plane and they're walking away. I'm like, something's not, this shouldn't be happening. The next thing I know, John is airborne. He's here too, but John, are you here? Okay, good. (laughs) Okay, good. Just checking. Okay, yeah, that's you, all right. <laughs> and then, but see, during this, this moment when they were talking it over, they weren't burdening him. And this is how God's laws are burdensome to us. They, they, they bind us from all the things that will harm us and they free us for all the things that will help us. And that's what God's instructions do for us. His word does for us, his laws and why we obey. And thankfully, John obeyed the instructors and continues to do that. And it frees him literally to fly. And that's what God wants for us. He wants to free us to fly. His mercy, his power, his freedom that we sung about to fly. We see this in Psalm 19. It's not a new thing. I love these verses. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. One of my favorite things. That, that, that something is true. You can put your feet somewhere, and that, should, that gives me, it just makes me smile. It makes me joy, rejoice that something is true in the chaos of the world. We have somewhere to put our feet that won't move. In him, there is no shifting shadow. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. All the, all the nations of the earth are dust on the scales compared to God. Thanks be to God. Something is true. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure and enduring forever. Beautiful. So we are blessed. It is not a burden. It is a joy. And in these next few verses of, of John 5, we saw him last week that there's this testimony that God has given his testimony that our faith in him is not blind faith. He has given a testimony, the spirit, the water, and the blood. What's that? The, when Jesus was baptized, y'all remember at the River Jordan public baptism? The spirit literally embodied, came down in a dove and lit on him. The voice from heaven spoke God the Father, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the water, the spirit, and then the blood. And the reason that that is beautiful is that God said, this is my son. He will save the nation. He is one with me. He died and rose from the dead. And when guys say, I'm going to die and rise from the dead, and they do, take note. Listen to them. It validated everything. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And God says, these are my testimonies on which you can bank your faith. And God is not a liar. So, our faith is not blind. Verses one through 12, there you have it. Defining Christianity, what is it? It is faith in the Son of God. It is love in his image and obedience, honoring that image in us. So is it faith or works? We are saved by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. It's like saying, you like left-winged planes and I like right-winged planes. No, no. Faith and works, like fly our lives. We are saved by faith alone, but the works ratify the faith. They show that we are born into his family when our likeness begins to appear. Virtually every baby looks the same. Unless you're 
Barney and Sarah Green's baby, and then you look just like a green. But uh, most babies look the same until they grow up in the image of their DNA, the DNA of their family. And as we grow up in the DNA of our divine father, that ratifies our faith. Got it? You with me? So, and the result of this is joy and confidence in God. Uh, we have joy in, in uh, 1 John 1, 4. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that we may have fel- you may have fellowship with us, our fellowship with, with God, his Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Um, and 2 John Verse 12, I have much to write you, but I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. In other words, our joy is made complete when we share it, when God fills us up and we spill it out. That's when God's love is completed in us because we have done what God has done and we have actually shown the steadfast sacrificial love to others that he showed to us and that completes the cycle and it gives us joy in him. And you all know, you've all experienced this if you've had that, um, uh, given a gift to someone or sacrificed for someone and you've seen the impact it had on their lives, you know the joy that you get as the giver. So, We have this confidence in him also. We have joy and confidence that we remain in him. So from 4, 16 and 17, God is love. Whoever abides in love, abides in God or remains in God and God remains in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we all have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. So we have confidence on the day of judgment when we meet God that we belong to him because we look like him in this life. And God will say, I recognize that one. So we love him back. So that's verses one through 12. Now, he has some concluding remarks in verses 13 to 21. Take me to the next slide, please. Are we stuck here? There we go. So verse one to 12, defining the faith, believe like Christ, love like Christ. Next slide. Remain. See, can I get it back? There we go, okay. Now, defined by the faith, how do we live? It's got some kind of trippy stuff in here. This is great. Love it. Okay. If you ever went with Campus Crusade or Billy Graham, the next verse will be very, very familiar to you. Verses 13 to 15, assurance before God. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so that's the answer to the first question. Can you be sure you know God? He says, literally, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you have faith, that you may know that you have eternal life. So, as Christians, can I just give you the good news? The agnostic, agnostics are wrong. You can know if you have eternal life. And God doesn't intend for his Christians, his sons and daughters to walk around wondering if they're in his family. God wants you to be sure that you belong to him. This isn't anything different than normal life. I wouldn't want any of my kids to wander around, am I really, really a member of the family? Am I, is it, are, are, are mom and dad really my mom and dad? You know I mean? Do they really, you know? Uh, maybe I'll try living at the neighbors for a while. No, no. You're our kids. We love you and we want you to be confident in that love. And God wants you to have that same confidence in his love for you and that you belong in that family. Are you perfect? No, which is why we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's just as much a promise as any other promise in scripture. So we have assurance before God that we can know that we have eternal life. And the outworking of that confidence is that God hears our prayers. So he goes on this two verse thing on prayer, which is pretty kind of trippy here. Just Check this out. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have what we ask of him. Now, what this is not, it's not, read it in context. It is not a blank check in prayer that you can just ask for anything and get it. It is not a blank check. God is sovereign and he will do all things when he is ready. Revelation 21, five, I am making everything new. But God involves us in weight-bearing roles in his plan, yes, through action, and yes, through prayer. I don't just believe prayer is about me just kind of recalibrating my heart to be in tune with his. I believe God uses prayer to change things 
And I believe this based on the scriptures because I see Abraham prayed for Sodom and got a change in the plan to us. That's called an anthropomorphism where God appears human and appears to change direction. Do, do we, we're not seeing behind the sovereignty curtain in that moment. We're seeing the, 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 sign, the human side of it. Okay, you with me? So Abraham prays for Sodom and gets a change in the plan. Moses goes to God and says, God, the people are hungry. God says, all right, I'll send manna. That's called prayer and an answer to prayer. Jesus himself said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are a few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send harvesters out in the harvest field. And guess what? We have teams on three continents right now. That's a part of an answer to the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples. So things happen when we pray. It matters. And God delights in our prayers for two reasons. This is a little mini theology of prayer in like three minutes. Okay, ready? Uh, personal relationship. There is a relational aspect to our prayers with God, our Father who art in heaven. And we need to be reminded that God is our Father. How lovely it is your dwelling place. I'd rather spend, you know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. That we are supposed to, to, to love God and, and fuel and stoke our love for the Lord in prayer. Confess our sins, renew our fellowship with God. That is all about personal relationship. But there's another aspect of prayer that also matters, and that is world renewal. Help me here. World renewal. Bring it up. Thank you. World renewal. That God is doing things through our prayers. No God does not depend on us. Y'all remember in Esther 4, she spends three days fasting and praying that God would change this decree. God would somehow deliver his people. And Mordecai comes to Esther and says, look, This decree is out there, and our people are going to be annihilated. And if you do nothing, I love these words, if you do nothing, he doesn't say, we're all going to get destroyed. He says, if you do nothing, God will raise up deliverance from some other place. But who knows, if you were not born for such a time as this, would you not want to be the one God would use to deliver? So the beauty of this is, friends, that the mantle of the weight of the salvation of the world is not on our shoulders, but we get to play a role in it. And I want to say, here I am, Lord, with Isaiah. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Put me in, coach. Put me in. So God does not depend on us. God decides how to run the universe. He sees all, we see small. He sees all, we see small. God decides how to run the universe. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane prays a beautiful prayer. Father, pass this cup from me, but not my will be done, but yours. And he submits, and God answers that prayer. No, I will not pass the cup. My will will be done. And so here's what we need to do, people. What John is telling us is go to God. Go to God for personal worship, for world renewal. Take your cares to God. Take your thoughts to God. I actually, years ago, not recently, I remember walking by one of my kids' rooms and I heard them talking in there and they wanted something from me. You know, I don't remember what it was. You know, I hope, I wish we could go to, you know, local baseball game or whatever it was. And they're like, oh, I I would never do that. And they're all debating. And I'm listening to them debate about what I would do. And I'm just like, this is so fascinating. And I just thought, you know, if they'd ask, I'd be happy to take them to a baseball game. But I didn't walk in there and go, oh, I overheard. Hey, let's go to the game. And we didn't. And I do think there's different, there's ways that God can work out his sovereign plan on earth in a million different ways. But he gives us the opportunity to participate in that by asking for things. And sometimes he'll say yes, and sometimes he'll say no, like any good parent. Okay, the kids, this is not a a democracy where we all get to vote and get God to do stuff. Okay, that's most of religions out there. As long as you just do the rain dance, you can make it rain. That's not our God. He remains in charge. He's still the boss. But he has many desires for us that happen, our desires happen to be in line with his and he will give us things that, we would not, that he would not have done if we didn't ask. So John is saying, hey, 
you know that you have eternal life, ask for stuff and see what God will do. Will has a great acronym, and I'm going to chop it up a little bit, but he uses, I call it the prayer bat, B-A-T-T. Um, I think I have that. Yep, here it is. Believe that he can. Ask that he will. Trust his love and thank him no matter what. So that's the, that's the ask part. Tim Keller calls those two things about world renewal and personal relationship. He calls them kingdom and communion. Kingdom and, we pray, Lord, your kingdom come and forgive us our debts and renew our hearts as your children. Kingdom and communion. Renewal relationship. And this is a beautiful way that John says, come on, give it a shot. See what God will do. See what God will do. Verse 17 He stays on the theme of prayer. If anyone sees a brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. He's talking about if you see a Christian brother sinning, pray for that Christian brother and watch God fill them with the grace to to course correct. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. What he's saying is I'm talking about people who are Christians and they're not on their way to hell. There is a sin that leads to death and that is the sin of the the two sins that I I told you before, people who who were not children of God who did not think they had to bring either their hearts or their works, right? They were... They were, they were hypocrites. They were, they were outside the family of faces. I'm not talking about that. Those sins lead to death. I'm not saying we should pray about that. He's not saying, uh, let's not pray about them. What he's just saying is, I'm not talking about that right now. I'm not talking about praying for them right now. He's not saying don't pray for them. He just says, what I am talking about is that we should pray for believers who are going astray and ask that God help them get back on the path, right? Um, while John was up in the flight thing, the guys were on the radio and they didn't make any comments. And I'm glad I didn't know until afterwards that they had some concerns about what was happening, but John did great. And he's still alive, as you can see. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there, there's some course corrections that, that can happen sometimes and, and, some, and that's what God does for us. He course corrects us. He gets on the radio. He lets us know. And we can do that for our brothers. And we, can help, we can help pray, radio up to God. Hey, God, please send some grace for this guy. He needs some help. And I do that all the time in my Bob group because I need help. Um, can you bring up my Bob group? Do you have it there? Um, uh, we were in a session the other day. My Bob group is our, it's our morning meeting that meets on Fridays. And I've got a big group of, you know, 16 guys, but then we have smaller groups of four. And in my group, it's that, which is actually three. There's three of us. It's me, Brian, and Fulton. And we pray for each other. And they know me really well. And they know where I struggle and what I need and, and how I, I need to be encouraged and strengthened. And we got each other's back. And I need them to pray for me. And it's not always just, well, you know, my, my back aches. Can you pray for my back aches? Sometimes it's like I'm struggling with, with this or that or the other, like heart issues, Guys, pray for me, and they do. And God uses that to strengthen me. Let's do that for each other. Because I have a congenital condition. Some of you have it also. It's called the Y chromosome. And this congenital condition causes certain patterns of behavior that need to be monitored and and assisted. And other people who have that same condition can help each other. And so we have support groups for that called Bob Groups. Bands of brothers, they get together and support one another. And so uh, I encourage you to, to be a part of one of those groups. The way the message paraphrases this uh, passage. For instance, if we see a Christian believer sinning, I'm not talking about those who have walked away in, uh, from the faith and are going their own way. We ask for God's help and he gladly gives it, gives life to the sinners whose sin is just stumbling, not departing. There is such a thing as a departing sin. I'm not talking about that right now. What I'm talking about is those who stumble. Let's pray for them that God will help. That's what it is. You with me? All right. So to conclude, he concludes on four truths to stand on. Can you take me to those truths? Four truths to stand on. They are, verse 18, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We know anyone born of God does not continue to sin, but the one born of God keeps him safe and the evil one uh, cannot harm him. So greater is he who is in us than he who is in us. We know this, he says. Secondly, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Amen. But greater is he who is in us. Thirdly, we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may fourthly know him who is true. So, we see uh, this, the, the Christ who is true is with us and for us. And that's how John ends. And he has this, little, this last verse, 21, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And he's just saying, um, anything that challenges your affection to God, 
is an idol. So I'd like to invite the worship team to come up as we close on this. What is an idol? Anything more that is important to you than God. This is Tim Keller. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. A, counter, a counterfeit God or an idol for us. It's not the thing in Indiana Jones, like a little gold you know, statue. For us, an idol is an idol of the heart. So take Paul Simon right here, right? And he sings about that. Um, he has a slip slide in a way. So if, if, there's, if, if any of you have idolized a relationship, for example, he sings about that in this 1977 song, someone who is idolizing a relationship. I know a man, he came from my hometown, he wore his passion for his woman like a thorny crown. He said, Dolores, I live in fear. My love for you so overpowering that I'm afraid that I will disappear. Y'all know it. Slip slide in a way. Slip slide in a way. You know the near your destination, more you slip slide in a way. Okay, so I'm not... Uh, I'm not Paul Simon, but <laughs> you get the idea that you idolize something and you take life from it over God. And so God's, John warns us in the close, don't do that. Take life from God alone. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus told us, this was talking to his disciples and said, I'm going to be going. And they were kind of freaking out saying, but how will we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So he said, look, I am the way. Guard against idols. I am the way. I am the truth. Believe in me. I am the life. Love like me. Believe in me. Love like me. And you will come then and join me and be where I am. And if as much as I love John, and I'm glad that he had a successful flight and continues to fly. As much as I love him, and, and when he was up, I was longing for him to succeed and be on the ground, actually, but um, to succeed at this. And as much as I was longing in that moment, imagine in your own heart something that you've longed for, some person that you've loved, some moment that you've had, and take that love for that person who's close to you, multiply it by a thousand and it won't touch God's love for you. He loves us so much. And so as we close 1 John, I just want to be reminded that the love that we have, for, that God is giving us, commanding us for others, He has shown to us in sending His Son. And He has sent His Spirit to fill us and now given us His hands and His feet and His voice to be His grace as we have received it. Father in heaven, I thank you for Christ, for the family of Christ, for the spirit of Christ, for the truth of Christ, for the grace of Christ, for the life of Christ, for the love of Christ. And Lord, may we as a church follow you the way. May we follow you where you stay, may we stay. And when you move, Lord, may we move as you led your Israelites in the desert and you lead us now. May we follow you always. In Jesus' name, amen.